Okay, so this is our last video about kinetics. Um, second order reactions mean that when you double the concentration of A, the rate quadruples because two squared is four fa times faster. When you plot data from a second order reaction on a, on a A versus time scale, it's very exponential in decay. So that's not linear. Not a good choice. Ln of A versus time leads to another exponential curve. But when you do the inverse of A, so one divided by A versus time, you end up with a linear relationship. Linear is good because we can apply Y equals MX plus B to it. In this case, your M is the slope. So it's not negative. This is the only one. The second order reactions are the only ones where the graph is positive. These both have negative slopes, okay? That's just a function of how integration works, okay? And so, once again, I provide this integrated rate law to you, but you do need to know when to apply it. You have to know that it's a second order reaction to use this one. And so when I said that it's in the format of Y equals MX plus B, this one comes out of the integration that way. So again, our, our slope, is about our initial concentration, in this case, one divided by the initial concentration. Or sorry, not our slope, I'm, that's wrong. Our intercept is about the initial concentration. So we're starting off with one divided by the initial. So that's this right here. So if the question is asking you, what's your initial concentration? You can look on the graph, figure out what this number is, and then invert it and you will get the answer, okay? Um, M is K, so it's not negative this time, like I said, it's a positive slope. T is time, and of course, one divided by the concentration at whatever time you're using. Okay, so that's, if it's 200 seconds, there's the point, and I can, I can calculate what the concentration is going to be using this equation. So that's what second order looks like. Um, relatively uncommon but but not that unusual you can find the examples of that all over the place okay um some additional vocab so this is a reaction coordinate diagram and it's basically showing us the progress of a reaction which is usually oops sorry which is usually um usually similar or related to the passage of time right so time is kind of increasing on the x-axis and then our y-axis represents energy requirement. So this is in the, in the crash course video, he was talking to you about the idea that every reaction has a little hill of energy you gotta get out. There's always some energy required to start a reaction. Otherwise, the reaction would just, would just kind of go, right? You wouldn't have to, it wouldn't exist in nature as separate chemicals, it would just kind of happen. Um, so, that top of the hill has a name, okay? And there's two names, actually. One is called the activated complex and the other is transition state. They mean the same thing, all right? It's just this kind of transition between the reactants and the products. So our reactant here is CH3I. So this, I'll just circle it here in pink because I want to. So this is our reactant. Okay, and our product that's trying to form, I'll do in blue, this is trying to be the product. These dotted lines represent bonds that are breaking and forming, and they don't actually happen simultaneously most of the time. Typically, um, one of them is harder to do than the other. It takes more or less energy, uh, depending on the thermodynamics of the reaction. But there is a transition state where sort of like the I is breaking away and the CH3O is coming into the picture, okay? Because these are both negatively charged, they're gonna kind of push on each other. So if the oxygen and carbon bond is stronger than the carbon iodide bond, then this can go to completion. What that means is you end up with that OC bond and the I minus goes on its own. And you get a lot of energy from that. When you make a bond that was more stable than the one that was there before, that difference in energy is released as heat. 
So that's called delta E. Also related to heat, that's from chapter five. We talked about that. Heat is Q, by the way. Just a reminder, that's going to come up again. All right. So we also talked about the fact in chapter five that everything has an activation energy. That's the amount of energy it requires to get to the transition state. So this hill. And sometimes activation energies are high and sometimes they're low and it depends on the situation. It's also important to understand that when the change in energy is negative. So in other words, here's our initial place and we're going down. So in this case, that's a negative change in energy. We call that exothermic meaning it releases heat. If something were endothermic, it would go up. So that's going from starting here, going up, that's positive delta E, endothermic, energy in. Okay, so that's kind of a reminder um, from chapter five. You may need to go review a little bit, but the reason it comes up in um, kinetics is because we are really trying to manipulate the rate of the reaction, which means manipulating the height of this hill or manipulating the state of the reactants and products so that they're a little bit closer, maybe in energy by having like higher temperature, let's say, that would push this over the hill a little bit easier. Um, so I have this question for you. Does the reaction rate depend on activation energy? So I want you to write some kind of answer down and we're going to put that in um, our next learning check. So I guess like just to rephrase this, uh, does the height of this hill matter in terms of the rate? Why or why not? All right. So for lab, we have a fun equation called the Arrhenius equation. And this dude talks about so many different aspects of chemistry that are just fundamental. In fact, we're going to run into his name again in module two in a different context. Um, but his discoveries were so important because they connected that random value that each reaction has, the K from the rate, to activation energy. And that's really cool. So if we can use the graph to get to K, we can find a couple of different properties. We can find something that we call the frequency factor. This is basically a numerical representation of how frequently particles collide with the right orientation and the right energy to make a new molecule. Okay, so you can get this from the graph. Whoops, you can get this from graphs. The EA, of course, is however much energy the reaction requires to get started. R in this context is the ideal gas constant, but not necessarily in the way we're used to seeing it. So this is our kinetics experiment, and there's a lot of really, really good information in here about all of this chapter, but I wanted to call your att attention to this very topic, calculating the activation energy and the frequency factor. So that's A and EA, and you're gonna do this. Uh, here's the equation. And here's the thing. This is another example where y equals mx plus b. So if you make a graph, you can find these values with pretty minimal effort, right? So y equals, uh, oop, this is backwards. Hold on, hold on, hold on. mx plus b. Uh, but, you know, like negative because logarithms. <laughs> so that's the basic format. So X is one over T. In this case, it has to be Kelvin. So you'll have to convert that from the lab. EA is something you're trying to find. And 2.303 R, R is our constant. This is from converting from natural log to log. And so we can find this value. We can find this value. All we need to know is the log of K, which is something you can calculate from your data, and you plot it um, by plotting the log of your concentration minus over time. Okay, so you're going to get all this info. Now, what it says here, what it says here is really important. So the next column, same page. It says this is the equation. Your slope is negative EA divided by 2.303 R. And R is 8.314 joules per mole K. So we are not used to using R in that context. Usually 
R is equal to 0 0.08206. But here, this is an example of using thermodynamics. So it's energy. So that's that's got to be in terms of joule. The, the numbers are actually the same thing. It's just a unit conversion issue. Hold on, I got that backwards. Joules per mole K is what I meant. Joules per mole. So the reason that the temperature here has to be in Kelvin is because of these funny units. The answer to this will be in joules. That's because we used R in terms of joules. So the K is gonna cancel um, and you're gonna get joules per mole, really. The A doesn't really have units because of the way that logarithm, the well, exponential functions work. So don't worry too much about that. But you're going to be able to calculate as long as you use the right R value and your temperature is, well, your X that you're plotting on your graph is one over T in Kelvin. Then you can, you can use that y equals mx plus b. This is the same thing, but natural log. So here, your, your slope would be a negative ea over r. Here's your r value. Your x is 1 over t. Um, this is your intercept. And this is what you're plotting on the y-axis. So when you do the lab, you're going to have to make a column where you've calculated ln of k and 1 over t, and that's what you're going to make your graph out of. Then your slope will be able to be used to find ea, and your intercept can be used to find a. Remember that. Remember that. Whether you use log or ln doesn't matter to me, but remember that when you undo it, let's just say it's 10. I'm just making up a number. Yours is going to be way bigger than that. Um, the base here is that e. So you go e raised to the 10 equals concentration of a like that. Okay, so but this value will be whatever you get from the graph. So that's why we graph in this experiment, lots and lots of graphing in Excel, plus doing the reaction calculations one at a time would be really, really slow. Okay, so all of this information is used to determine a mechanism. So second order reactions mean two molecules are needed to come together. So in this case, the example of NO2 and CO is classic. This happens in your um, uh, catalytic converter in your car. Okay, so NO2 gets converted and CO get converted. CO2 is much more stable. NO is much more stable. It's happy for everybody. Both of these have to be positioned exactly right. It's really difficult to do that without a catalyst. That's why your car has an expensive catalytic converter because it turns out palladium is the best, um, at least that I know of, to do this reaction because it positions both the CO and the NO2 in exactly the right way so these oxygen can connect to the C and everybody goes about their business. For first order reactions, it means only one molecule matters. It's not really about collisions in that case. It's really just the thermodynamics of the one piece, right? So this is a collision. This one is really just kind of like, in this case, the bond breaking. So we're showing these electrons breaking off and going with the bromine. And so you end up with this funky charged thing, but that's only one molecule that's changing. Here we have two that are reacting together. So that's about orientation and speed. So we call that unimolecular if there's just one molecule. So that's first order, overall first order, not with respect to a particular reagent, but overall. So you add up all of your exponents to figure that out. If your total of the exponents is two, we call that bimolecular mechanism. Two molecules have to be oriented correctly. If you add it up and there's third order, we call that term molecular, term means three. I could not even find a picture to show you of an example of this because they're not very common. And then this is a nice summary of the different rate laws that might be associated with each overall rate order. If you get unimolecular, it's always, it's always first order. But if you get bimolecular, it could mean two different things are coming together, or it could mean two of the same thing are coming together. So that would have slightly different looking rate laws. Termolecular could mean a whole bunch of things, three different things, two things, and a different thing. You know, it could be all different combinations, but the exponents are all going to add up to three in that case. 
Um, in this case, this is interesting. These two are kind of like any of the things you manipulate is going to have the same effect on the reaction. But here, if I want to increase or decrease, I'm going to mess with A because it's going to have the biggest impact. So that's the value of a rate law compared to the overall rate order. Okay, so another reaction coordinate diagram here. So it's time or reaction progress versus energy. And so we already talked about what a transition state is. These are sort of very temporary states that you have to get enough energy to get to that position, but once you do, usually things fall back into place. Sometimes when you have a multi-step reaction, you may have more than one transition state, um, particularly if you have more than one bond breaking. In between that, we have something that is semi-stable. It's lower in energy than either transition state is, but it's not as low as, as like the products or the reactants. This is called an intermediate. Okay, so an intermediate is something that we can usually see in real time. We can measure it with an instrument or we can see a color change or something like that. Transition states exist for such a short period you can't usually see them. Okay, and then of course products and reactants we can see all day long. They're, they're very stable. This is a catalytic converter in your car, cut away. And if anyone's ever had to replace one of these guys, they are expensive. Oh, I didn't learn about this until I'd already replaced a couple of them while I was in college because my cars weren't great. Turns out you can recycle these things for a fairly large amount of money because they have platinum or palladium catalysts in there and you can regenerate them. They just need to be cleaned basically, chemically. Uh, so anyway, you can take those to a metal recycler and often get quite a bit, you know, a pocket change. So these are interesting because um, in the inside of your catalytic converter, it's a solid and the thing it's converting is a gas. So we call this a heterogeneous catalyst. Um, they're really quite common because the solid kind of pulls the gas down and holds it in place so that another gas molecule that's rushing by can react with it. A homogeneous catalyst is like what we're going to use in lab. The copper nitrate is a solution and your chemical reaction is a solution. So they're both the same phase, both aqueous. Um, so those are pretty common too. Your body is one giant example of a homo homogeneous or homogeneous um, catalytic system. In fact, you have hundreds of thousands of enzymes in your body, billions probably, working right now. I like biology. I'm a biochemist. I find it fascinating. Um, this is one of my favorite processes. So this is DNA being synthesized. And it turns out you need a whole lot of enzymes to do that, uh, which is good. You wouldn't want your DNA being synthesized randomly. So each one of these cartoony looking things represents a different enzyme. All of them are held on to DNA with intermolecular forces, almost always hydrogen bonding in that case, sometimes dipole-dipole. But each one of these does a different job and they're all enzymes and all of them have to work in concert. I'm sorry, that keeps happening because I have a mouse wheel. All of them have to work in concert in order to get your DNA to copy, which happens in almost every cell of your body all the time, except for your blood cells. They don't have DNA. Also one other, I can't remember. Where. Another example, I like this one, is an enzyme called catalase. And it turns out we have this enzyme, but also lots of other creatures do, especially yeast. So you can go get some yeast that you would use for breaking bread and some hydrogen peroxide that you would use for sanitizing your wounds. And you can actually make some oxygen with it. If you do this, be very careful. Oxygen is flammable. It's like the most flammable thing in the universe because fire needs oxygen. Anyway. Check out YouTube for, um, there's a whole bunch of examples of like making um, solid phase rockets out of mason jars and this reaction and a piece of pasta. It's kind of cool, it's kind of fun. Um, so th th that's able to happen. This reaction happens without enzymes all the time, but it happens faster if you have catalase present. And that's important because if hydrogen peroxide gets into your blood, bad stuff happens. So your body has to neutralize it as quickly as it can. This is why um, sanitizing things work. So bacteria don't generally have a lot of catalase reactions, although some do. Um, so what you can do is by putting H2O2 on there, they don't have a way of stopping the hydrogen peroxide from ripping apart their cells. And you do. So that's why they die. 
Other really important examples of enzymes in nature include the nitrogen cycle. Without this, nothing on earth exists. Everybody thinks oxygen is important, and it is, but truthfully, nitrogen is usually more limiting. Phosphorus is too. So it has a cycle just like, just like oxygen does. We start off with nitrogen in the air, lightning striking the air, you know, just like a lightning bolt, can create NO2, which then falls down in the rain into our water systems as nitrite. Okay, so NO2 minus. Nitrite fixing bacteria in the water can turn that into nitrate. There are nitrate fixing bacteria in the water, but they're very um, like uncommon. So most of the time, the nitrates seep out into the dirt where a lot of bacteria can turn nitrate into ammonia. There is one particular classification of bacteria that I find really interesting because they live in the nodules of peanut plants. So this is a peanut plant. These are the roots and these little bumpy bits are little nodules. And inside of there is a symbiotic relationship between the peanut plant and a particular bacteria that does this reaction really, really well. So it takes nitrogen and converts it all the way to ammonia. Plants cannot use N2. Elemental nitrogen, not useful for plants or animals, but this particular bacteria can convert it into ammonia, which we can use to do, um, well, everything. We make amino acids with it, um, a lot of our, a lot of our um, DNA residues need some nitrogen in there, all kinds of stuff like that. So we need ammonium. It's one of the most limiting things in nature. If you don't have enough ammonia, you die. It's fertilizer, right? So you can tell a plant that doesn't have enough ammonia because it gets yellow and it starts to wither. The bacteria that's living in these nodules of the peanut plant has this really, really cool metal cofactor. So they exist, um, let's see, where is it? Where you go? Here and another one down here. And they're the same. And what they look like is this crown of iron, sulfur, and molybdenum. And this was such a surprising discovery because molybdenum is not normally considered essential in biology. It's really weird. By the way, this is spelled molybdenum. It's an element many of us don't know about, but it's cool. Okay, so this molybdenum is the secret in making this reaction work. And people have tried making this and they've tried making this work without this big giant protein around it and it won't because the reaction has such a high activation energy all by itself, just from N2 to NH4, that it just can't happen at room temperature. Um, so nature beats us again, but people are still working to try and make this work industrially, because if you could make ammonia this way, it is far cheaper than the way we're doing it now. So these are some old statistics from 2012, but it remains true that only 1%, a little more than 1% of the Earth's power goes to making ammonia. That's because we have to do it with a catalyst, by the way, but it has to be at really high temperatures and under a lot of pressure. So 100 atmospheres, that's a lot. To make something pressurized, short lesson in chemical engineering here, to make a vessel pressurized costs energy. You have to pump that material into the container. Uh, so that costs money. Pumping is energy. And then hot, hot, hot. So of course that costs money too. Um, so it's a really high activation energy. We've got to put a lot of energy in. We've got to compress it. We're going to learn more about why we have to put pressure on it. But suffice to say, we spend a lot of money making ammonia every year. Because without it, we wouldn't be able to grow crops. Um, and people would be starving even more than they are. Um, this was invented by two guys, Haber and Bosch, and one of them is a chemist, the other one is a chemical engineer before there was really chemical engineering. And their story is really fascinating because they invented this um, catalyst and the sort of chemical engineering tactics that are used today in order to create ammonia, and they did not patent it. If they had, they would have been billionaires. Um, but they chose not to because the world needed this technology and um, that's why we're not starving to death. So it's a really cool story. My advice to you guys is go find a better way of doing this. In fact, I just read a paper the other day. Somebody has discovered a new method that might work um, on the industrial scale. And if so, 
and it costs less money, that's, that's amazing. That could really change the American, or actually the world. It could change the world. Um, it's not just about money, it's about energy use, right? So that's an environmental thing. Anyway, so you could make a tidy money, a tidy profit from figuring out how to do this better, but also help the world. I hope. 